to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Rage. 
Good morning and welcome to King's Church Penwitham online on our Sunday online service. We are glad that you could join us this morning. For those who are listening regularly for the first time and for those that maybe it's their first time of listening, a warm welcome. My name is Zena and I'll be guiding you through the service this morning. May the Lord bless our time together. May you know the touch of Jesus in your life this morning and just allow his Holy Spirit to fill every area of your life. We come now to worship him and we think foremost of who he is and what he has done in our lives and will continue to do in our lives. I want to do two readings this morning and I want us to pause and I want us to stop and I want to meditate on these verses and think about what they mean to us, to me personally, this morning. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 37, verses 25 and 26. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends and lends, and his descendants are blessed. He is our Father who watches us and knows what we need at that right time. And when his way is always the best way, a loving father who has our interests at heart all the time. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you now. We thank you that you even know what we're going to say before we even say it. Thank you, Lord, for that you just love us so much and you give us everything we need when and and where and just at that right time lord we are so so grateful this morning thank you that you are indeed our shepherd thank you that you never leave us and you will never forsake us lord speak to our hearts we pray this morning to each one that is listening right now that you will really get into that core of their hearts and really speak to them through your holy spirit Lord, bless our time together. We commit it all into your hands to have your way. And we invite the Holy Spirit to do as he wills this morning. So Lord, we commit everything into your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to now um, continue with the service. And we're going to um, have a time of the family talk, which Patrick's going to bring. And then we're going to go into our time of worship. And Patrick's talk is all about I am the door. So thank you, Patrick. Well, good morning, kids. Uh, a few weeks ago, Helen talked about the time Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, today we're going to take a few minutes to think about what Jesus meant when he said, I am the door of the sheep, which is found in John chapter 10. But first of all, we're going to have a little quiz. And I wonder if you can guess who lives behind the famous doors that I'm going to show you. So who or what is behind this door? It's got a big number 10 written on it. It's perhaps the most recognisable door in the whole country. Do you know who lives here? Well, it's 10 Downing Street and it's where the Prime Minister Boris Johnson lives. What about these? It's an impressive set of gates, isn't it? I wonder who might live behind gates like those. Mm, any ideas? Well, it's Buckingham Palace and it's the Queen who lives there. Now, this door doesn't belong to a real person. It's from a book and a film that's a favourite of mine and it opens up a whole new world. Any ideas? Well, it's the wardrobe from the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe that leads the land of Narnia. 
So what did Jesus say about himself being the door? John chapter 10, verse 7 and verses 9 to 10 as well. Jesus says to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I can and may have life and have it abundantly. In those days, people would see lots of shepherds looking after their sheep. Come on here. Uh, the sheep would need to find water and pasture in the daytime, but also need to be protected, especially at night, from wild animals like bears and wolves that would eat them. In the picture, we see that the shepherd has rounded up his sheep into the sheepfold, and he sat down to sleep in the entry. Nothing can come in now to harm the sheep. They're not going to wander off. He's keeping them safe. In the morning, he'll let them out to find food. And Jesus used this picture to speak to his disciples and also to you and me. We are the sheep. The sheepfold represents eternal salvation. And Jesus is the door by which we enter into salvation. If we think about the doors we looked at before, they give us access to whoever lives inside. Maybe with lockdown lifting, you've been invited to grandparents' or friends' homes again. And when you accept the invitation, you know there'll be a warm welcome at the door. But we also know that a couple of those doors we mentioned belong to very important people. You can't just pop in and visit the Prime Minister or the Queen. You need a special invitation to visit them. Imagine if tomorrow morning you received a letter addressed to you and it was an invitation from the Queen to a party at Buckingham Palace. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing? You'd go to that, the door and the doorman would look at your invitation and he'd say, welcome, come on in. Well, Jesus says some wonderful things here. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When we come to his door, he invites everyone to come and to put their trust in him. And when we put our trust in him, he warmly welcomes you and me into his home, into his sheepfold. And what is more, when we come to him, we enter into eternal life, we are saved. And what's more is he's the only one who gives us access into the very presence of God himself. We have peace with him as we come and go in life with the promise that one day we'll enter through heaven's door and see God face to face and spend eternity with him in his heavenly home. How much more amazing is that than an invitation from the queen? Now, very importantly, doors keep intruders out, no intruders. Imagine if you had a big hole in the wall. Well, anyone could just walk in and help themselves to your TV or your computer or your dog or your cat. And it'd be very cold and drafty as well. As it is, doors help keep our homes safe and secure from intruders. And when you go home and lock the doors, you feel safe from the outside. And Jesus mentions the thief, perhaps like a lion or a wolf that will try to steal and kill and destroy the sheep. That's very much like the devil and like temptations that seem good but only lead to destruction. But Jesus comes to give us abundant life, life to the full. It's a life that starts here and now with things like peace and joy and love and goodness and kindness, all manner of wonderful things that money can't buy. So it's really important that you put your trust in him and keep following him every day as you go through life. And remember that Jesus is the door to eternal life.
Thank you, Liz, for those two amazing songs of worship. It really encapsulated who God is. Great and awesome is he. The whole world, the whole earth is filled with your glory. And those he saves are, are, are his delight. He will hold us fast. And thank you for Patrick, too, on that um, explanation of I am the door. I thought it'd be good before we have our reading and Kevin comes to talk, just a moment of um, quiet prayer. I'm going to read a psalm and that's going to be the basis of our prayer. And when I've read that, we're just going to have a time of quiet just to reflect and just to bring those things to the Lord. And then I'll, I'll close that time. 
So let us pray. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid with the hand to her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, we thank you that we can boldly come to your throne and worship you. Thank you, Lord, that we can come and talk to you freely and openly. Lord, just open our hearts this morning. We thank you for those requests that you have made, that, they, that, that we each have made, and that you have heard. We thank you, Lord. So, Lord, now we just come and we just um, commit the reading to you that Dorothy will bring shortly and the time that Kevin will um, be talking and bringing your word. Bless him and fill him with your spirit as he comes. In Jesus' name we ask all of these things. Amen. So Dorothy's coming now and she's going to read um, from Colossians chapter 4. Thank you, Dorothy. Good morning, church. I'm reading from Colossians chapter 4, the NIB version. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tertichus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your heart. He is coming with Anisimus, Anisimus, sorry, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, Welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you, and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, 
see that it is also read in the Church of Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Good morning, friends. It is good to be with you today. And uh, this is the last of our studies in the book of Colossians. Um, you will know quite well that I've uh, written a book about Colossians. Uh, it's called Hope in Desperate Times. Uh, and if you haven't had a copy and you'd like one, you've just got to email me, email me pastor at kingschurchfm.org.uk. And by emailing, you can uh, get a copy. Uh, they cost two pounds each. That's what they cost me from the printer. Uh, so that's what they cost you when you get them passed on. Let's pray and then we'll have a look at this last chapter of Colossians. Uh, on to new, uh, new things next week. So Lord, we call on your name. And we ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to your word. And as we look at your word, there would be wisdom for us guidance for us and hope for us. Holy Spirit, come amongst us and bless your people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's nice. We had a buzz on the line before and it's gone now, so that's very good. So we're looking at this fourth chapter and this fourth chapter has an awful lot of names in it. And, and, and you sort of wonder, well, what's in there that seems so very important? But it is, because if we want a growing church, it gives us the three steps we need to make, uh, to take for our church to grow. It talks about prayer, it talks about witnessing, that is sharing our faith with others, and it talks about working together as a team. And if we don't do those three things, a church will never grow. It's so important. So we are looking at prayer and the power of the gospel. And, and the first thing to say is that there is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. In fact, it's a truism, but even the lone ranger wasn't alone, was he? He had Tonto, after all, to accompany him. And we all need others. We need a passionate prayer life. We need a heart that is ready to share the gospel and good news of Jesus. And we need a team of people that are committed to each other as well as committed to God. If we're going to go forwards in the faith, those I would think are the three steps that are necessary to church growth, prayer, witness and teamwork. We see it in Paul's life. Epaphras has come to him. He needs Paul's advice about these people that are taking the church astray. But Paul also needs the help of the Colossians. He specifically asked them to pray for him while he is in prison. So they need one another. Mm. The gospel is empowered by prayer. So the question is, what are we doing when we pray? Is prayer simply an attempt to persuade God that he should do what we ask? You know, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth. That's not really what prayer is about, is it? It's far more the other way around. We're asking God actually to work in us, to bring our hearts and lives in line with the values and desires of his kingdom. We're not praying my will be done, we're praying thy will be done. It was John Wesley who said, God does nothing on earth except through prayer. And we have to understand 
the value of prayer. So how do we know what God wants when we come to pray? If we've got to put our lives in line with what he wants, with his will to be done, how do we know what he wants? Well, that answer is fairly simple, actually. He has revealed it in his word, the Bible. There are many, many, somebody counted them at one point, I hope it was a computer, uh, many, many promises in the Bible. They said that there are 32,000 promises in the Bible. Some of them are general promises that apply to everybody. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. And so as we seek more of God, as we ask for him to move, we find that he answers those prayers. And my question to you today is, do you pray the promises of God? What do I mean? Do we find the promises that pertain to us and then bring them back before the throne of God and say, Lord, you have promised to do this. You've promised to pour water on the dry ground and floods on the thirsty ground. You've promised to pour out your spirit on all people. Do we bring his promises before him rather than just dance around our needs, but specifically remind God of the things that he has said he will do? Because when we pray according to his will, he will hear us and he will answer. I have a, a very good book on prayer by R.A. Torrey. It's an old book and it's simply called How to Pray. And this is what Torrey says. If we are to have real faith, we must study the word of God and find out what it promises. Then simply believe the promises of God. Faith must have a warrant. Trying to believe something that you want to believe is not faith. Believing what God says in his word is faith. If I'm to have faith when I pray, I must find some promise in the word of God on which to rest my faith. And so I challenge us again. When we pray, are we praying the promises of God back to God? That's the first thing. But, but along with it, it's not just praying his word. It is also asking in faith. We have to believe that we will receive. Mark 11 and verse 24 says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. That doesn't give us a blank check to pray for anything that we want. No, rather it shows us the attitude we must have when we come to God. We need to have an attitude that he means what he says, that his promises are true. And as we rest our faith on those, we believe that he will give what he has promised. That's the kind of prayer that God answers. Paul shows the process of prayer here. In verse two, he says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. There are lots of lessons in that, aren't there? A devotion to prayer. That means be consistent, be regular with prayer, uh, watchful, specific, focused, earnest and thankful prayer are the things that Paul expects of himself and he teaches us to do. Being watchful, what does that mean? Well, I think it means having one eye on God and one eye on the world understanding that God overrules in the affairs of men and women and that as we see what's going on we need not fear because we trust God who is behind the rain clouds who is able to overrule and that's what watchful prayer is it's looking up to God and it's looking out to the need Paul wrote to his dear friend Timothy I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness. And so we don't just pray for our own needs. Our prayer has to be much broader than that. We can pray for our family, we can pray for our church, we can pray for our nation, pray for the nations of the world, all those in authority. 
So prayer is meant to be wide ranging in its scope, but it is meant to be specific in its requests. If we don't make specific prayers, we cannot know when they've been answered. There is a very popular prayer. It comes from the prayer book. Uh, and this is it. It says we pray for all people everywhere according to their needs. I'm sorry, but that's not really a very good prayer. The problem with that is you cannot know when it's answered. If we're simply praying generally, all people everywhere, it's too nebulous. We need to be specific when we bring our requests to God based on his promises and ask him to move in the circumstances. And that kind of prayer is hard work. It's not just a brief appearance before the throne of God. In verse 12, it says of Epaphras, this is the pastor of the church in Colossae, that he is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. Part of the pastor's work is to pray for his church. And that word wrestling that is translated there can also be translated as striving in prayer, labouring earnestly, labouring fervently, or remembering you earnestly in prayer. The different Bible versions translated in different ways. It's a word that comes from the arena, uh, the Greek wrestling arena, as people grappled with each other. So we are meant to enter into a grapple uh, in that sense with God. And so the first key to prayer, what was it? It was praying back the promises. The second key to prayer, do it in faith. The third key to prayer, being guided by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And this kind of deeper, fervent prayer can be part of our experience as we give our lives into the care of God. In fact, every time we come to prayer, we need to pray, come Holy Spirit and guide me in my prayers today. One of our members was telling me on Zoom a week or so ago that when she went to pray in the morning, she didn't feel like it. But no sooner did she start than the Holy Spirit took over and suddenly there was a joy and she came out of prayer different than she went in. We need to understand that it is the Holy Spirit that guides our prayer. And what he does is he gives us joy. <laughs> it doesn't just tell us to pray earnestly. It says to, to be watchful and thankful. We've been talking about thankfulness already in this letter, uh, to be uh, respectful and thankful to one another. Um, do you remember the old gospel hymn? When upon life's blessing, uh, life's billows you are tempest tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We don't just need to besiege God with requests. We need to be thankful people. <laughs> and as we do, we can trust God for the outcome, because it is true to say that there are three possible answers to prayer. God can say yes. And God can say no. And God can say not yet. He can ask us to wait for that prayer. Uh, I, I like uh, what the uh, an old pastor of mine used to say. And he said, sometimes God answers prayer with a thunderbolt. And boom, it's like a miracle. The answer is there straight away. Other times he puts the answer on a tortoise. And it's there and it's coming and it's been answered. It just hasn't arrived in our situation yet. That's certainly what happened with Daniel, if you remember, in uh, the book of Daniel. He prayed 21 days and the answer was dispatched on day one. But it wasn't until the 21st day that the answer arrived in his situation. <laughs> so that's the first thing that we need to do. The gospel is empowered by prayer. Without prayer, we're going to get nowhere. But the next thing is we have the privilege of 
witnessing. This is verse five and six. We need to, need to remember where Paul is. He's in prison. And so what does he pray for? He prays for the obvious thing. He prays for an open door. But it's interesting, it isn't an open door to his prison. He prays for an open door for the gospel that he might preach the message as he should. <laughs> we would think in prison that there was no opportunity for uh, Paul to share. But he saw the very time in prison as an opportunity to share with the guards and those around him. Uh, later on, he writes to the Philippians. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Philippians was written a little after Colossians, and it shows us that the prayers had been answered. Indeed, in the closing verses, he says, all the saints send you greetings, especially those in Caesar's household. And so the gospel had even reached the royal palace and people had turned to God through Paul's imprisonment. Hmm. He simply prayed for an open door for the message. I suspect if we don't have opportunities to share our faith, either God hasn't yet opened the door or more likely we haven't asked him for an open door for faith. Uh, and that's what we should be doing. Praying first, not trying to push the door open ourselves necessarily. I like what Rick Warren says in his book, The 40 Days of Purpose. He says that, that serving God is rather like catching a wave, a surf on the sea. He says we don't make the waves, we just catch the waves that God is sending. And when we pray, he sends big waves that we can surf on and we can do the things that he wants I know John Wesley was more proactive in his approach. At one point they said to him, Mr. Wesley, you shouldn't be so forceful in sharing your faith with people. You should wait for the opportunity. So he thought he would put that to the test. And apparently one day he was traveling in a carriage with other people and he waited for the opportunity to share faith with them. After a whole hour of waiting, the opportunity hadn't come. So he decided to make the opportunity himself and share his faith anyway. And sometimes there'll be a natural opportunity. It will come in conversation. Other times we have to be bold and we have to share our faith. What did he say? We need to do it clearly and kindly. Verse five and six. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Yes, the way we act is also watched. And the first rule of sharing our faith is that we must not cause offence, at least as much as we are able. Someone needs to know that we care about them. They're not just somebody to witness to. They're somebody deeply precious to God and we need to share the love of God with them and sometimes being very practical, friends, neighbours, people that we care, gives that opening to sharing our faith. Indeed, we were doing the Talking Jesus uh, uh, course this week and that's one of the things we were saying that we need to share practically uh, to encourage others. There is a saying, you may have heard it, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. It's not completely true, but it's a, a good thought. They don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And for Christ's sake, we don't simply preach at people. We share the love of God that it may be proclaimed clearly and kindly. <laughs> we are to live godly lives, yes and make the most of every opportunity. And the great thing is, God has opportunities just around the corner waiting for us. Ephesians 2 and 10 says this, it says, we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. They're already prepared. The works he wants us to do are there waiting down the road. If we will go prayerfully and openly, God will give us the opportunity to share with others. But we need to do it as gently as possible and in the wisest way we can. I thought as I was preparing about some of the opportunities I've had to share uh, over the years uh, and all of these things really happened. Um, how would you speak to somebody who came to you and claimed that they were going to a clairvoyant? Would it be like Star Trek and suddenly up comes the red alert sign, eh, 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 you know, look out, look out. And, and so you dive in and you tell them that they're being stupid. Is, is, is that the best way to approach it? Perhaps that's not the best way. I asked, well, why are you doing that? Do you think it's wise? You know, if these people really do contact people on the other side, where's the power coming from? Because God says it's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. And God says there is no way that spirits come back. So what are they connecting to? Is it evil spirits? Just putting the warning in there. What about if somebody came along and said, oh, you can't believe the Bible. Of course, it's all myths. It's all fables. Would you get angry and defensive or, or perhaps ask them which bit of the Bible did you mean? Or when did you last read the Bible for yourself? I remember a man that came to me after a funeral once I'd spoken and he said, oh, you can't believe the Bible. He says it was written years after by people who weren't really there. So what I did was I took him to the start of Luke's gospel. I said, well, just have a look at this with me. And it said at the start, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And it seemed good for me to draw up an orderly account. What's Luke saying? He's saying he's been to the eyewitnesses. He's spoken to them. He's investigated it. And then he's written it in historically accurate account. And so I sent this man a copy of Luke's gospel. Uh, some months later, I met him again at another thing. He said, I read that book you sent me, he said. And I've got a whole different set of questions now. But to speak to people kindly as we speak truth is so important and of course it isn't just us as free methodists that find the bible useful uh, the church throughout the years has found inspiration and many famous people have been inspired by the gospel people like john wayne errol flynn napoleon isaac newton william gladstone F florence nightingale even elvis presley i've seen elvis presley's bible uh, it's owned by a museum in London. And today, uh, people like Johnny Cash more recently and uh, Bear Grylls even, they have found inspiration in the word of God. And we can say that we do too. Well, the first thing is that we must pray. The second is we must be willing to share our faith. The third thing is, if we want a church to grow, the presence of friends. Christianity is a team sport. It was never meant to be done as loners. And Paul, he didn't work alone. <laughs> and we, he introduces us in, in these uh, last verses from 7 through to 17 to his team. And we have them there, Epaphras and Tychicus and Onesimus and Aristarchus, Mark, Luke and Demas. And, and they've all got a story. We can't spend a long time looking at them, but Tychicus... He's highly commended by Paul, isn't he? What does Paul say? He calls him a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. And actually, Tychicus is the man who is given the copy of Paul's letter to take to Colossae. He's the postman. And he gets there. If he hadn't got with the letter to Colossae, we wouldn't have had our copies of it today. So he was a successful postman. He did his job. And accompanying him 
going back to Colossae was a slave. His name was Onesimus. Onesimus had been a slave in the house of one of the Christians, a man called Philemon. And Paul wrote a letter to Philemon that went at the same time. And the interesting thing about Onesimus is his name means useful. But actually, he was a useless slave because he'd run away from his master. He tried to hide in Rome, but he couldn't run away from God. And God had turned Onesimus to himself. And now he was going to be reconciled to his Christian master. But Paul says, not as a slave, much better than that. He's going to be useful to you now because he's going to be a brother. And so the Christian faith elevated the slave Onesimus to being a brother with Philemon. Perhaps that's why Paul starts the chapter by saying, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. That's Onesimus. And then two of the gospel writers are there, Mark and Luke. They're traveling with Paul. Luke is introduced as a doctor and we're told he's not Jewish. So he's a Greek speaking doctor. And of course, the Greeks were the top physicians of the day. They were the first people to trace the circulation of the blood throughout the body. And we find that Luke is not simply writing the book of uh, Luke or the book of Acts. He's experiencing it. He's traveling with Paul. And several times in the book of Acts, the word we is used when Luke betrays his presence. He's there in chapter 16 when they travel to Philippi. He then stays in Philippi. And when Paul comes back through again in chapter 20, he rejoins him and travels on to Jerusalem. In 21, he appears in Caesarea. And finally, he writes, and we arrived at Jerusalem and the brothers welcomed us warmly. That word we and that word us shows that Luke was there. And then he leaves Jerusalem with Paul and he's shipwrecked with him on Malta. Uh, and he ends up in Rome standing with Paul, not as a prisoner, but as one who can help him. The gospel writers, Mark as well, there alongside. And there's that strange sentence about Mark hidden in this word. It says, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Well, why wouldn't they welcome him? It's because on the first missionary journey, Mark, Barnabas's cousin, accompanied Paul and Barnabas. And halfway through the journey, he gave up and went home. He wasn't able to finish the work he'd begun. And so Paul didn't trust him. And on the second missionary journey, when Paul sets out, Barnabas wants to bring uh, Mark with him. And Paul says, no, I don't trust him. <clears throat> and they have a uh, dispute. And the dispute was so strong that Barnabas and Paul parted company. But it does seem in the end that Barnabas was right because here is Mark in prison with Paul and Paul is offering forgiveness he's offering him a second chance and he's saying if he comes you've received instructions about him welcome him in Paul's very last letter which is uh, second Timothy uh, he tells Timothy get Mark and bring him in with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry and so Mark is restored. He's a good example of somebody who was a bit slow to start, but actually once he got going was a great blessing to others. Have you ever had a, a false start in a race? Years ago, you allowed two false starts. These days, the uh, athletics are not so forgiving. One false start and you're out. Well, Paul was not that harsh and the scripture isn't that harsh either. We may have got it wrong in the past, but if we continue in faith, God brings us back and restores us. Paul worked with a team and this team were devoted to prayer. They made the most of every opportunity that came before them 
And that was what made their mission a success. But it's perhaps important to say they were not simply devoted to God. They were devoted to one and other. And if our church is to grow, it will take all three of these things. It will take a dedicated prayer life. It will take boldness and kindness in our witness and it will take working together with each one bringing the gifts that we have to bless God's people and to praise his name. Hmm. Oh, and it will take just one more thing. What's that? Well, it's the very last verse. It will take the grace of God because without God's grace and that word grace means unearned or unmerited favour. God's favour upon us, not because of what we have done, but simply because through Jesus Christ we are loved. Once we have come into a relationship with Christ, God's grace is upon us, not his anger. We are at peace with God through Christ. And so Paul closes with those words, grace be with you all. Well, can we have a growing church? I pray that we can. It's so important. Uh, I'm going to pray now and then we're going to sing uh, before uh, Zena comes back and closes the service for us. So let's pray. Lord, grant us to be at least from time to time and much more than we were, those who wrestle in prayer with you, those who are looking for every opportunity to share in faith in Jesus, and those who are committed to each other in your church. We pray this through Christ, our Lord. Grace be with you. Amen. Well, thank you, King's Church and friends. Our closing song, uh, it's the newer version. It used to be called Be Thou My Vision. It's now called You Are My Vision. And Mark is leading us in song. You Are My Vision. <laughs>
Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Kevin. We have a lot to think about and it would be good to go away and pray about some of those things that, that Kevin has mentioned this morning. For me, we're talking about prayer and boldness and witness and working together, but we need to keep our eyes upwards and on the Lord. He is our vision. And when we keep our eyes on the Lord, then everything will come together. Amen. We're coming to a close now of our service. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been involved today. Really, really grateful. Really, really thank, thank you very much. Thank you to James for his patience and all his technical skills there. And most of all, we say thank you, Lord, that you have come through your Holy Spirit and really spoken to our hearts. We thank you. Um, I've got no real messages, just to remind you that next Sunday um, there's a catch up with Sam, I think in Tony and Helen Cochran's garden. Um, I'm not quite sure if you have to contact them, um, if you're going to go, because obviously there's got to be certain numbers in their garden, so please do that. Um, let's close in prayer before we have our benediction. Lord, draw us closer to you this week. May we experience your goodness, your love, and of all you are to us. Lord, keep us rooted in you and in your word. Increase our faith. Increase our boldness to witness for you. Lord, empower us with your spirit as we pray in faith through your spirit. May we always be thankful because, Lord, you provide everything we need as we have spoken and listened to that during this service this morning, that you are indeed our Heavenly Father. And, Lord, when we pray, it is like that big surf, that wave, that you are going to give us more and more as we come boldly to your throne in faith. So, Lord, we thank you for meeting with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to close by um, sharing some, a uh, few verses from Philippians chapter 4 that may encourage you um, this morning. So just some few verses from chapter 4, very familiar to lots and lots of us. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, thinking of each other as we say this, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. We talked about being gentle in the way we witness. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And may God, 
and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And we all say Amen. So we've come to the end of our service. Thank you for joining us. May you be blessed by what you've heard and what you have sung and what we have prayed. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. God bless. Bye for now. Bye. If I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Cause your love never fails. You stay the same.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul. 